Welcome to Virtual March Meeting. Today my talk is about um, the control of transmon qubits using a CMOS integrated um, chip use at, operating at, at cryogenic temperatures. Outline of my talk is as follows. I'm going to start by explaining how transmons are controlled. I'm really just going to review this. I'll review what transmons are, how we control them, um, what the considerations in terms of control are. Um, once we have the basics down, I'll go over um, how people do this today, what kind of hardware is used, and really importantly, why it's not scalable to, to future fault tolerant systems. Once I've motivated the work, I'll present the design and implementation of a cryo CMOS controller, followed by experimental characterization. So this is a basic diagram of a transmon qubit. Um, the qubit itself is made up of a nonlinear LC resonator. Here we have um, Instead of just one Josephson junction replacing the inductor in a parallel LC resonator, we have two. This is a squid, which acts as a flux tunable nonlinear inductor. Um, you can tune the effective value of this inductance through an external bias that threads a flux through the loop. Um, we also have an XY drive port on here, which we can use to couple energy at the resonant frequency of the, the qubit into the circuit. Turns out if you, turn, you cool this down to temperatures low enough such that thermal energy in the environment is lower than the effective photon of a, or effective temperature of a photon in, in the resonator, then it behaves quantum mechanically. And this nonlinearity gives us a really nice feature called anharmonicity, which means that the spacing between each of these levels is different. What that means is that if we want to drive from the zero to one state, we want to drive at omega zero one. If we want to go from one to two, or back, we drive at omega 1, 2, and so forth, and all these are different frequencies. The more nonlinear the qubit is, the, more, the, the bigger the difference is between each of these spacings, and the easier it is to address an individual spacing. So if we can constrain our drive signals to just omega 0, 1, then we can just address the 0, 1 subsystem, and it behaves as an ideal two-level qubit. Okay, so the transmon qubit is a circuit, and when we operate it, we typically want to be in just a zero one subspace, which means our, our drive signal at the RF port needs to be band limited such that we don't hit omega one two. Um, to put some numbers on this, typical frequencies for omega zero one are four to eight gigahertz, which means that we really need to cool to the 10 millikelvin range so that we have sufficiently suppressed thermal noise in the resonator. And our anharmonicity, or difference between omega 0, 1 and omega 1, 2, expressed in hertz, is about 150 to 350 megahertz. As I'll mention shortly, this is an engineerable parameter, as you see here, based on the C in the resonator. Um, if we write the Hamiltonian of the system in the lab frame, we find we get this form. You have two terms. First, you have the sigma z term, which is um, describing a, a natural rotation about the negative z-axis at the qubit frequency. And then you have a drive term due to this, this drive source here. And that causes a rotation around sigma y. Okay, if you look at what's going on, you see that, that this term is causing it to rotate around the negative z-axis, whereas this term is causing a y rotation. Um, we usually like to think about it not in the lab frame, but in the, the rotating frame. So if we write the rotating wave approximation, we get a slightly different expression, but we no longer have the sigma z rotation, and things are easier to think about. So if we drive at omega zero one with sine omega zero one t and a phase pi minus phi d, where this is a controlled variable and some envelope function, we find that the Hamiltonian looks like this. And we have a sigma x and sigma y term and their, their um, weights are dependent on the phase of this carrier signal. So if we control the carrier signal, we control the rotation about sigma x and sigma y, or the rotation about some axis, which axis the vector we're rotating about is. It's going to be in the xy plane, but we can control where it lies. And the amount of rotation is determined by the envelope. Um, so we can set this envelope to determine how far we rotate, okay? And we can set the phase, as I mentioned before, to set which axis we rotate about, okay? So basically when we design our control pulses, 
we want to to engineer these things to get what we want. Um, so how do we pick the envelope? Well, there are a couple of considerations. We have a finite coherence time for transmon qubits. It might be 50 microseconds. It might be shorter, depending on, on what the exact circuit is. Um, but we can engineer this anharmonicity by choosing C. Larger anharmonicity means we can have more bandwidth in our pulses, which means we can make them quicker. Um, so we'd want smaller C to do fast gates. Um, on the other hand, the dephasing time T2 um, is determined by the frequency fluctuations of the qubit. And we want to be insensitive to charge noise so that if we move around, if, if our charge moves, then the frequency doesn't jitter and um, causing, causing dephasing. So it turns out what the beauty of the transmon is, if you put a big capacitance, you really desensitize yourself to the charge. You really flatten these curves out, and so charge noise doesn't hurt you as bad. So there's this co these conflicting design um, criteria. You want a small capacitor for onlinearity. You want a big capacitor for large T2. Um, because of this, we typically end up with 150 to 350 megahertz range for our, our anharmonicity, um, which gives us single qubit gate times in 10 to 30 nanoseconds range. Um, and we have coherence times typically 30 to 100 microseconds. OK, so how do we actually shape the pulses? Well, we want to avoid the omega-1-2 transition. We want the pulse to be as quick as possible. If we were to use rectangular pulse, we'd get this sink side lobes. And we, you know, it doesn't roll off very fast. So we want to do something more clever than that. Um, Gaussian pulses have been quite popular for a long time. You usually have to truncate them or, or have some limiting function you multiply them with so that they don't go on for all of infinity, because the Gaussian never really um, ends. Um, another kind of convenient pulse that has well-defined start and stop sign is start and stop time is the raised cosine you can see here. And you can see the spectrum of all these different pulses. So the Gaussian is without a limiting function, so it would pick up some side lobes also. But you can see both the Gaussian and raised cosine roll off much quicker and, um, and allow us to, because of that, we can, we can do much quicker pulses than if we were just using rectangular shaping as you might do if you're driving, say, a, a spin qubit. Um, so in this work, we'll use raised cosine, but I do want to acknowledge Gaussian as well. Um, is this all we want? Um, even with, with this raised cosine, we'd still like to make the pulses as short as possible, so people like to do things like second order um, shaping. Um, in addition, as you drive the qubit, it's a nonlinear thing, it's frequency changes. So depending on if you want to drive a pi pulse, 180 degree rotation, or a pi over 2 pulse, which is typically half the amplitude, you might need to drive at a different frequency for the two. So there's a stark shift that you might need to compensate. So to get rid of, um, so one thing that's used is, is drag. Um, drag, we put in a, a derivative term that's weighted. This is in quadrature, if you want to think in the, the microwave terms. So you have a sine and a cosine carrier term. Um, and if you do it right with drag of, of 1, you get a notch at some frequency that you can set. If you set that at omega 1, 2, you can avoid the omega 1, 2 transition uh, by adding this extra, extra modulation tone. Um, and typically, there's, you also want to do an amplitude dependent offset to compensate the Stark shift. When you see the, the work we've done, we haven't done this more advanced um, shaping, but we'll, it's something for future work. Um, so I wanted to introduce it anyways. So a couple practical issues. How strong should these pulses be? I could go through all this math, um, but event, essentially you're going to end up integrating the envelope amplitude. Um, and you're going to find when you get out some for, for um, a raised cosine pulse, some level, and it's typically, you know, depending on if you're raised cosine, Gaussian, other types you're in, or rectangular, you're somewhere in the 50 to 500 microvolt pulse amplitude at the, the port of the qubit. Now, we need to really lightly couple the qubit because we don't want it to decohere the qubit um, through coupling to our 50 ohm source. So, you know, you're typically using atofarad type capacitor to couple 
So you're very weakly coupled, and only a small fraction of the energy that's available at that port makes it. Just to put some numbers, this is, you know, maybe negative 65 dBm, negative 70 dBm of, of power available at that port, but you're attenuated by about another 30 dB before you get to the qubit. Or, sorry, another 60 dB, not 30. Um, another important thing is how much noise can there be on the drive line. Um, noise here will cause up-down transitions, which will hurt your coherence. We really don't want this. Um, so you can write an expression. I've written it in a way that looks nice to microwave engineers, where the rate is the bandwidth over which you couple times the, the ratio of the effective temperature of this resistor, if, assuming it's, it's going to put out um, white noise, thermal noise, to the, to the temperature of a photon at the, the qubit frequency. That's at 1 gigahertz, a photon would be 50 millikelvin. At 5 gigahertz, it would be 250 millikelvin. Um, we can, um, I already said these. We can um, plug in for this, the delta omega. It's the ratio of the qubit frequency, the, the omega zero one one to the, the effective Q due to the drive circuit. So if you, the only thing dequeuing the qubit were the drive circuit, that would be this value. And this is inversely, this is one over the T1 due to the drive circuit. We typically set that to be about a millisecond, um, which corresponds to a Q of about 40 million for a five gigahertz qubit. Um, you can do some simplification, and if you were to set this one over the rate of transitions, so effectively how much your qubit decoheres due to, um, due to the noise on this line, and make that equivalent to how much the qubit relaxes due to damping by this resistor. If you make those two things equal, you find the amount of noise you can take on the drive line is one photon worth of noise. Okay, that's independent of the coupling, so it's an easy thing to remember, is that we really want to have thermal noise on here equal or less than the, the equivalent photon energy. Um, we cool these things to, to 200 or to 10 millikelvin, so we can take a little bit more noise than just the noise, thermal noise of the attenuator, actually quite a bit more because it's exponentially suppressed um, with cooling. But, um, but not that much more. Um, okay, so that's the basics. How is it done today? What kind of hardware do we use? And why do we want a different approach? Um, this is a block diagram of the basic configuration of Google's electronics for a high picture. I've highlighted the XY drive because that's what this talk is about. Um, you can see that the, the one channel, this is driving one qubit, has two DACs. We use in-phase and quadrature modulation to do single sideband mixing. Um, so we create two sidebands, we upconvert it, filter, attenuate quite a bit. Um, see 43 dB of attenuation, so roughly um, the ratio of temperatures. Um, actually not quite, but, um, and then um, couple of the qubit. So if we're doing a big experiment, I would say at least at where we are right now, this is the right way to do things. Um, you know, my philosophy is that we should do things brute force until we can't because getting the qubit um, physics sorted out and everything is, is more important than, than integrating electronics and, and doing the electronics, you know, in the, the most scalable manner when we're just carrying out basic experiments. So I would say this is the right way to do a small scale experiment, like 100 qubits. But we still required, so this is 72 qubit, it's not the quantum supremacy chip, but it's another chip that um, we were measuring before. 72 qubits requires 240 AWGs, 84 up converters, 12 down converters, 24 high speed ADCs, 160 coaxes to the cryostat, 168 coax is down superconducting. These are not cheap. There was an article in um, Tech Review a couple months ago about the shortage of these. <laughs> um, and, you know, something that I think is really crazy is it takes three terabits per second. Now, these are narrow band pulses. Okay, they're not broadband. There's a lot of 
there's not that much information in the pulses. And yet we take three terabits a second um, to, to continuously drive this thing. So for a small sale demo, I think this is the right way to do it, but we need to think about other things as we're moving forward. Um, what is the ultimate end game? Well, this is essentially where we are now. This is a 72 qubit processor. We're just on the cusp of being able to do things you can't do with a, a um, classical computer. In fact, just within the last couple of months. Um, but our long-term goal is to be over here. And at least if we're using transmon qubits with their associated error rates and we want to do something like surface code, we're going to need a million of these qubits and we need to find some way to, to make this connection. So how are we going to get from here to here in terms of, of control? So this is where we are. This is, you know, I'm going to use 54 qubits as a number. And you can see this isn't even all the cables you'd have. If we want to scale to a, a million or so using this, what does it look like? Well, this is one. If we scale to, you can see all the cables in here, not much extra room to put stuff if we do things exactly the same. So if we want to go to 540, okay, I'm just making a point here how much we, how far we need to go. 8,000, 138,000, a million. That's how far we are in terms of building systems from where we want to go, okay? Um, clearly, we have to do something different. So how do we do things today? We have classical computer, high-speed digital bus. That's where that three terabits a second was going. Um, we have racks of equipment, coax cables going to the cryostat down to the chip. This is good for 72, it's probably good for 500, might be good for 1,000, but it's not good for a million. Um, one approach, and this is not the only approach, is to take this part and bring it a lot closer to the qubits, okay? And then we have to figure out how, say if we put it at four Kelvin, we have to figure out how to get down to the qubits, but we might be able to use superconductors for that. Um, at four Kelvin, we can get quite a bit of cooling capacity, with a standard cold head, you can get a watt and a half. Um, if you do something closer to what CERN does, you can get kilowatts. Um, so it's not that outlandish to think about cooling large, large arrays, but we need to make these low power and, and um, scalable. And then we need some really reduced data set going to classical computer and you know, all the air correction layers and so forth. Um, so here we're thinking about how can we simplify XY control. And before showing architecture, the architecture we've used, I want to make a point, is that this is really a brute force approach. We're using high-speed DACs to generate narrow band signals. And these DACs, if you look at the data sheets, are able to generate, this is an example, it's a little bit higher speed DAC than what we're using, but it's just one that's available from analog devices. And this is an example of a spectrum from basically DC to 900 megahertz, where they populated it with 157 modulated tones, and they left a dead band in the middle. Now, if you're working in communications, this is important because you don't want these different signals to, to have intermodulation products with each other and fill in this space, which would give interference if you were trying to use that, that gap for signal. So they make these DACs really high performance to be able to do things like that because that's really the driving market for a lot of these DACs um, in terms of, of development. Um, the cost is that they're very power hungry and they don't optimize things like data rates and so forth. Um, so it can do this, but we just want to do this. Okay, we just want to have a nicely shaped spectrum that we can control. And I would say that this is really overkill and if we want to have scalable systems, we need to find some other way to do it. And this talk is really, the work we're going to show is really a first step. Okay, so, so what were our goals here? Well, long term, we have a set of goals here, and then we have some goals for, for this initial work. And we really relax the specs a bit because we've designed this controller without models to figure out how the transistors are going to work cold. Um, so, so we had some, some headroom for that. So for our initial work, we want to work at about 3 Kelvin. Um, we want to be in the couple milliwatt power consumption range, which is about three orders of magnitude lower than that chip I showed on the previous slide. Um, 
We'd like to operate over a broad frequency range. It could be more fine-tuned for a, a more permanent um, solution. Um, we'd like to have about 10 milliamps or millivolts of, of amplitude so that we have margin because we're designing in a, without real good models and we might have less in the end if we don't over-design. Um, we'd like to be able to pick a couple well-defined waveforms and play them back rather than sending a continuous stream um, so we pick four bits or 16 waveforms. Um, they'll be able to operate in the 10 to 30 nanosecond pulse duration, um, not hit the one to two transition, um, and have performance that is able to hit you know, the fidelities needed for, for error correction. So just a bit of a spoiler is that we weren't actually able to characterize these last two, and that's, that's work in progress. Um, so. First, I'd like to explain the, the approach we took to waveform generation. So it's much different than the approach that you would take if you were just making a DAC. So basically what we realized is that if we don't try and do things like drag, we just need a symmetric envelope. Raise cosine or gauss, and they're both symmetric. Okay, so what we did was we built an array of programmable current sources and then had the appropriate enabling functions to create this kind of wedding cake shaped current waveform. And so we can program the amplitudes um, and so forth. And if we filter this, we get rid of the steps, and it looks like a nice, smooth, um, symmetric envelope. OK, so this gives us the E of T. We then need to put it on a carrier. Um, so we, we have a mixer to do that. We have an off-chip um, LO signal and a limiting amplifier to um, drive the mixer. And then we have some filtering to give us to get rid of the harmonics um, and end up with a nice modulated signal. So this is all fine and good. We could control, um, you know, if we can, but, but we don't have phase control here, okay? Um, so we need to add another quadrature to get phase control so that we can do vector modulation, you know, sine plus cosine. If you weight the two, you can, you can give an arbitrary carrier phase. Um, and if we don't do anything else, if we just have a quadrature, we only get 90 degrees, so we have to add a polarity switch so that we can do plus and minus in each quadrature to get the full 360. So that's the full picture here. Um, we generate the, the quadrature carriers off chip for simplicity, but that can be put on chip in the future. Um, so this is the part I already described. Um, in addition, we have this waveform memory that can, can store um, 16 different waveform configurations, and then we have four select lines to pick them and a trigger signal to enable a pulse. Um, so I'll go quickly. This is not a circuits conference, so I won't spend too much time on, on circuits, but there's a state machine to generate those, those pulse waveforms that just turns on the current sources, turns this one on, and this, 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 and goes backwards down the current sources, so you get a increasing um, pulse. This has a nice feature doing it this way, is that if we just try to take one of these and use it to make it and turn it up and up and up, then back down, we might have issues where we're non-monotonic. That is, you know, if we set it, say, halfway a full scale to move up, it might actually move down because of, of things that go wrong when you cool. Um, by doing this kind of thermometer turning on like this and turning back down, we get guaranteed monotonicity, which is nice in the pulse. Um, each of these current sources has eight bits of, of control, which is a little less than the 14 bits that are typically used in a DAC, but we have enough degrees of freedom that we can make a wide range of waveforms to compensate for that. Um, after creating the, the staircase current, we modulate it onto a carrier. Um, we want to be very careful, as we're trying to get as low power as possible, we want to be very careful to not dissipate a lot of power on the LOs. So this, we have an amplification chain that is really optimized for power consumption to dissipate something like 1, 200 microwatts per channel. Um, there's a, a tunable ballon and a differential stage. This is made with what are called standard cells mostly. Um, and then there's a mixer. Um, there's that polarity switch to switch which way current's going through the mixer. So current will either route, let's say, polarity's high, it'll go this way, and then say like this, whoops, back down to here. 
or it'll go the other way, depending on how the polarity switches are set, and then we couple out and combine um, in the current domain at the output. Um, the chip was made in a 28 nanometer CMOS process. Um, you can see the critical things, the transformers, the DACs are quite small. In fact, this chip is, it could be a lot smaller, it's bond pad limited. That is, we're limited by I.O., not by the, the chip periphery. All this is empty, this is more or less empty. Um, we packaged it, you can see it's, it's mounted in a cutout on a printed circuit board to keep the RF lines really short. Um, the, the clocks come in over here and then there's digital programming and supplies coming off the sides. Um, it's matched to 100 ohms, so we have a Klopfenstein taper transforming that to the output. Um, the yellow signals come in here and here. As you can see, that's pretty tight and there might be some coupling from here to here and here to here. We're driving the qubit on resonance, so that could be a problem. So um, we need to take care of that externally for this chip. Um, the future, you could, you could cancel that out on chip actually. Um, so we packaged it, tested it first at room temperature. This is an example where we're driving the qubit with an RF of 5.6, or the, the chip with an RF of 5.6 gigahertz, um, negative 10 dBm, so 100 microwatt of RF signal. Um, clock at, at 2 gigahertz and negative 20 dBm clock signal. So this is going into the quadrature hybrid. External, this is going into an external ballon. Um, so any losses haven't been taken out. Um, and you can see this is going through the 16 different waveforms. These are just kind of arbitrary waveforms like stepping here. And I think one of these is Gaussian, one's raised cosine and so forth. Um, so we could, you know, get waveforms like this up to eight gigahertz RF, even beyond a little bit and with up to three gigahertz clock. Um, so once we tested it at room temperature, we want to test cold. Um, this is the basic setup for how the chip was mounted. Um, we have in the, the Google software back end, we have some interfaces to the chip. We use digital AWGs, so just putting out switching waveforms to connect to the trigger and select. We use a microprocessor to send the SPI to program the chip. Um, and then we clock it with a, with a CW source and provide the carrier with another CW source. So the, the carrier splits here, and I'll explain why in a second. Um, so at the output of the chip, we have two couplers, and I'll explain the function of these momentarily. Then it goes to a 20 dB pad. We had a little too much power, um, and so we had this. Then we have another 20 dB cold so that we, we reduce the thermal noise because 3 Kelvin, of course, is too much. Um, so these couplers are used. The second one is so that we can couple a signal out to monitor at room temperature, which is quite useful to make sure the chip's working as expected. Um, then the other one, we have a vector modulator we go and recombine, and that's to cancel out any LO le leakage so that we're not driving, um, driving Rabi oscillations unintentionally. Um, we also hooked up the standard qubit electronics through this path so that we could do baseline measurements. Um, finally, we completed the setup with the Z control, frequency control of the qubit, um, and a readout chain so that we could, we could make measurements. So once we got this all set up, the first thing we wanted to do was make sure that LO leakage, which we expected to happen and would drive Rabi oscillations, um, is, is negligible. And well, first we um, looked at the waveforms of the monitor report. You see that you don't get that inf much information from them. It's because we have coupling and it's weak signals to start with. You don't have much signal to noise. Um, but these are typical signals that would be used in a gate op operation. Um, Okay, so that's, that's the first thing to look at. Next, we looked at um, feed-through cancellation, so canceling out those Rabi oscillations that, that would happen because of LO feed-through. Um, so the way we did this was we first reset the qubit to the ground state, then we waited for a certain amount of time and made a readout pulse, or applied a readout pulse and measured the state. We varied this delay so that we could trace out any kind of Rabi oscillations. And before we applied any cancellation, um, we, we saw this kind of of chevron curve. And so, you know, the, for this, the qubit was set about here. That's a qubit frequency. And you can see clear Rabi oscillations. So something like a period of about 300 nanoseconds, which is pretty quick, okay? Um, so, th so this is kind of really not desirable. Um, it would really mess our experiments up. 
So we applied, so we play with the vector modulator and we're able to really in all this out, you can see now this time scale is 500 nanoseconds, this is 20 microseconds, which is longer than the coherence time of the qubit. And you see really negligible um, one state population at the end, something like 4%. Um, so the cancellation worked and this was actually stable over the course of days, so um, it's practical. And as I mentioned, um, you could just add another channel. We have a vector modulator. You could just add another channel of control to do, put this on chip. Um, once we canceled out the LO feed through, we did Robbie experiments. Um, so where we just applied a, a X pulse of varying amplitude. So we're doing a Robbie amplitude experiment then and a readout pulse. Um, what you'd expect from this, of course, is, is sinusoidal oscillations. Um, and what we saw when we just swept using the raw DAC codes was something like this, which really doesn't look nice. Um, so for this, we were sweeping um, the overall envelope amplitude, which is controlled by a current source, which turned out to be non-monotonic. So the reason you see all these wiggles is not because the measurement was noisy, but actually because the DAC was not you know, increasing linearly. It was going up and down. Um, and so what we did was we used a spectrum analyzer and measured the power at the monitor port to calibrate this axis. And once we did that, you can see all of a sudden it, it really cleaned things up. Um, since, you know, if we, well, we view this as okay. Um, we have to do calibration in a system like this anyways. And what really matters is that you can find a point, say, right here. Um, so this, this experiment kind of showed that we can control um, the, the envelope amplitude. We did, haven't said anything about phase, so we did another experiment that's similar to a, um, that, that helps bring out the phase. So what we did here was we um, reset the qubit, then applied three pulses. So these are X pulses that, with varying amplitude. And then we applied a pi over two pulse um, around the, the, with varying phase. Okay, so, and then we read it out in the end, and if you simulate and figure out exactly what should happen, um, the probability of finding the qubit in the zero state at the end looks something like this, where you get this, these peaks. So we, we then ran the experiment with um, standard and our hardware, and found this is what we got with the standard hardware. It looks almost identical to that last plot. Ours is a little more fuzzy. Um, we attribute this to the fact that we didn't calibrate the amplitude for this um, of the, the pulses. Uh, but nonetheless, the general shape is still there and the peaks are about the same between the two curves. Um, so this, you know, we view as showing that we have coherent control. If you look, kind of more proof of coherent control is that if you look at the residuals between the ideal curve and what we measured, this is standard, this is the CMOS chip. And you can see there's really structure in here. That is there's this bright part here, this dark part here, um, which is kind of indicative that we could calibrate it out. Um, then we measured two state population. This is to, to characterize, do we have more bandwidth than we're expecting or something like that? Are we driving two state? What we did for this was applied a bunch of pi pulses. And at the end, measured the probability of being in a two state. We swept. Um, we swept the, the pulse duration from 70 nanoseconds down to about 6 nanoseconds, and we saw, as expected, not much two-state population until we got really short pulses. So this is doing about what we'd expect. Um, finally, we want to make sure we weren't blasting the qubit with noise. Um, that's a concern given that, um, that we have active current sources. Um, and we, so we measured T1, and we got almost identical curves within the, the measurement error for the standard and um, custom hardware. So a comparison shown here, um, really the critical things are that our chip was less than two milliwatts. The standard approach is a watt. Two milliwatts is even getting close to where you can think about cooling down large numbers of these. Um, the data rate required to control the chip, we had to send those four control lines in. We had to send a trigger so that all adds up to about half a gigabit per second, about 50 times lower than the Standard solution, although you could make it a lot lower just by putting a sequencer on chip without much extra, extra power. Um, so in summary, if we're going to build big systems, we're going to need something like this. 
Um, this isn't the only way to do it, but cryogenically cooled controllers is one option. Um, we've demonstrated one with two milliwatts of power, or actually less than that. Um, in the future, we need to, to if we're going to make more of these, we really need to random, perform randomized benchmarking and, um, and really quantify the actual fidelities we can achieve. Um, and if people want more information, there's an open access paper with all the details. Um, and the link is here. So if you want information, pause it. All right. Um, I'd like to end with just a picture of the team. A lot of people contributed to this work through the, the measurements or um, the hardware, software stack, and so forth. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge the team. All right, thank you. Thank you.